All right. I have uh, the honor of presenting the here. I stand in a bit of a split personality. My day job is I'm a professor of organization and management at uh, Copenhagen Business School. I have a long history in culture and identity studies. So there was some recognizing of these debates on purpose. But the reason I'm standing here talking today is that I recently, two years ago, became chair of the Casper Foundation and deputy chair of the Casper Group. And to those of you, I should not knowing who is the Casper Foundation, I hope you know the beer, but nevertheless, it is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, enterprise nation uh, in the world. It was founded in 1876 by the then owner and founder of Carlsberg Group, J.C. Jacobson. And the Casper Foundation is unusual because it consists of five professors which are elected among the Royal Academy of Science, which is, as you know, an academic community. So you have first, you have a foundation board chaired by professors. Then the purpose of the, of the foundation is twofold. One is to be the majority owner of the Carlsberg Group. And this is get related to the uh, stock ownership and also to supersee, in that sense, the Carlsberg Laboratory, which was actually created before the company, and that brings us back also to innovation. We, we execute that ownership by our policy of engaged ownership and having two members at the supervisory board of the Carlsberg Group. But just for those of you interested in corporate governance, it is the supervisory board of Carlsberg Group that takes the decisions of Carlsberg Group but we act as a majority shareholder, both as a member of the board and always as, of course, an active shareholder in any way you do that. The second purpose of the Casper Foundation is to take the profits generated and donate that to basic research in natural sciences, humanities, and social sciences. So we are among the large philanthropic organizations in this country and donate money for basic research. And it was interesting that now we, it, you could be led to the belief that purpose is a new invention in management. And I can tell you it's not. Actually, this was the purpose. And it's interesting that the founder actually used the word purpose in his will. And these are called the golden words, probably because they are carved in stone and painted in gold. He didn't call them the golden words himself. But in his will, and when he donated the company to the foundation, he made this articulation of what should be the guiding principles for the Casper Foundation in maintaining its ownership of the Casper Group. They, they are articulated in the charter of the Casper Foundation, so in that sense, they are very important guidelines for how we should overlook the company. So one thing you could say, yes, purpose can have be almost timeless because it is part of our charter obligation. I think it's also important to note that this is more a narrative than it is a set of bullet points, a set of value statements. There was this discussion of purpose as an important source of sense making and without going deep into it, I think we all know that narratives are more distinct and narratives are more open for sense making than uh, secluded and closed value statements. I also think it's important to note that it has uh, some of the issues we've talked about, like the long-term view, not the, regardless of immediate gain. It has a focus on products and quality, and it has the focus on keeping brewing at a high and honorable la level. And I should say that, of course, if you look at the history of Carlsberg Group, I think it's fair to say there have certainly been periods of the history where this purpose has not been center stage. And you could also say it has prevented growth in periods. Some would say the professors have been sitting on the laurels and not participated in the acquisition game in the 90s and the beginning of the zeros. So there are certain... But I think, I think where I have found it most important has been to the, some of those critical decisions that we have made, where it also has a moral component, which we haven't talked about yet, about what is it to be at a high and honorable level. And in making the difficult decision of exiting Russia, which we did uh, five weeks after the um, invasion, I think in our board, in the Casper Foundation, and also in the way I have communicated it to the Royal Academy of Science, I was very keen on referring to the purpose because that was 
what does it mean to have a high and honorable level as a global company today in a situation of war. So I think it is very crucial also for the discussion. The purpose is not something you evoke on an everyday basis, but it is certainly a very important guidance in some of these critical moments and critical and very dilemma-ridden decisions. But a purpose also has to live and I think it is fair to say that since the founding, obviously, Carlsberg has become a much larger, fortunately has become a larger company. There has been many new uh, acquired companies on board. And, and when new management, there has been many shifts in management. But let's say that the brewing past was probably lost a little bit around 2009 to 13 for a lot of different reasons. There was a need to revisit the purpose to make it more inclusive. And in that sense, also, to, we've heard a lot about the role of employees and middle managers to make it rele relevant to all the local markets. So there has been a quite substantial and extensive process in revitalizing the purpose for the Carlsberg Group, defined now as Brewing for a Better Today and Tomorrow. And you will see we talk about it as our purpose tree. And you will see that it has a stronger focus on the brewing dimension and the quality and perhaps less on the mall dimension, but you should note that the long time horizon, which at the end of the day is where the rubber very often hits the road in making these difficult decisions, is still in there. And that was a process, that was a comprehensive process, uh, including more than 200 managers in the company, and I think that is also important that you also recognize, we heard about the differences in, across the world, that you recognize it has to have relevance also in Malaysia and Laos and China and uh, all these other parts of the world where Casper operates. And, when, and, you, and you can say, when, when has the purpose become particularly relevant? You can say, in the sense it's easy, we do give back to society. One third of the dividend of Carlsberg represents our part of the capital is used for philanthropic activities, to research, and also his son donated his brewery to another foundation that we supersede. So it is an essentially both science, the arts, and youth communities that is part of the giving back to society in the more philanthropic sense. We've also, and I stressed the long-term view, and I think that has been extremely important to Carlsberg. Carlsberg was one of the first companies in this part of the world to sign up for science-based targets. They were very first mover on innovating for alcohol-free beer, also because we are blessed with this laboratory that has a very strong research arm. But all of these investments, and I've noticed exactly, carbon is uh, it's gonna become an expense in the future, but all these long-term investments, I think, have been very crucial, both in particularly probably in the responsibility area, but of course also in, in our case, in alcohol free, food, free beer and climate resistance and so on. The role of the employees have been addressed, and obviously we can see both when we recruit whether it's to the supervisory board or it is at the local markets. This uh, sense of purpose is extremely important to modern day's employees, and in that sense, it is also something that we activate. We try to create experience opportunities that would open soon here in Copenhagen, again in the old Casper area. We communicate the purpose, and we try to make it clear how we link to it without claiming that it is always relevant at any time for any of the 400 brands, because it's not. I think it's very important, at least in my view, that the corporate, the, the, to the extent that purpose relates to the brand, it's at the corporate brand level, and it is this guiding principle in our decisions on innovation, ESG, our portfolios, and the way we engage with local societies. And then you can say our founder has particularly also focused on quality and this uh, dedication to innovation, which was very crucial. And, and uh, I should say that that was already at the origin uh, of the Casper narrative is we were the inventor of the first clean beer, sort of yeast that was donated among others to Heineken. Uh, and that has followed the narrative and the use of the activation in saying yes, all these new alcohol-free beers, which was a lot of investment in the future, was important, and the dedication to the science-based targets, for example. So last but not least, you can say, yes, of course, the purpose can also be activated on occasions 
in talent and acquisition retention, that's clearly where it is very important that has already been stressed by the others. I would say to the corporate branding, but one should be very, very careful, and I think that is also echoed in the, some of the questions of moral washing or green washing or purpose washing. There's a very, very thin line between where it becomes too much of a communication message. And you can say in our case, we had this 150 years almost of using the purpose. So we have experienced it in good times and bad times, but I think it is something we can see there's a growing interest. There's a growing demand for me to come out and articulate the purpose in various parts of Carlsberg Group. And we strike that balance all the time and where we clearly draw the line is to say this is not a marketing slogan. We cannot relate it to specific product brands and we cannot use it for deliberate marketing purposes because that was never the intention. It is the guiding principles for the long-term view of the company and it can be activated in various places. But in conclusion, I just want to say uh, yes, we are very aware of the risk of over-exploitation, but on the other hand, I have learned the hard way that some of these very difficult decisions that we have obviously faced, um, the purpose was absolutely crucial. And I think that would be also in, in our priorities in the innovation pipeline and how we execute on the ESG targets will also be very related to the purpose. Yes, I'm, I'm going to call you out a little bit uh, on Russia, right? Because you, you had to make a very difficult decision recently, you know, on Russia, right? Yeah. Can you maybe talk just very briefly about to what extent? Okay, sorry. I'm going to call you out a little bit on a very difficult decision that you made recently in, in Carlsberg, the company. Not that recently, it was five weeks after the invasion. Uh, it was already yeah. in 22. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. But recently, fairly recently that you actually with decided to withdraw from Russia, right? And so, I, and I, can you talk a little bit about purpose in that connection? That's the, the question. I think if I may go back to the golden words, I think it is crucial to say what, what is Carlsberg about as a company? And there I would say as an identity researcher also, what are the intrinsic values that Carlsberg as a company should cherish? And to me, the critical, there were two dimensions of the golden words that were critical. One was regardless of immediate gain, because 20 billion loss is a significant loss that we faced in terms of what was on the books at the time. The other is what is a high and honorable level. And that, has not, that goes way beyond earnings. That is essentially about what kind of company do you want to be in the future with respect to the past. So I think that was essentially a moral decision and I'm sure, of course, there has been a lot of discussion in the boards because, I mean, as I said, the, the losses were substantial. And now what we, we will just now, as you know, it has been acquired by Putin, given away to some of his friends from the St. Petersburg Mafia. So, I mean, the reality is there's enormous shift in valuable assets in Russia as Western companies exits. But nevertheless, you can say in spite of that, we felt that this was the right, we could, we could not confront ourselves with the spirit of the founder as a foundation uh, staying in, in, in a war, in a company that's yeah. at war with Europe. Thank you very much for focusing on that. It was very great to hear what you had to say. Now I call to the floor. <laughs> I call to the floor Thomas, Thomas Thune. Thomas is, has several board positions, but one of the most important one is chairing Erste, which is an alternative energy company and, and one of the best Danish companies, an icon. Maybe Thomas. What role does ownership play and, or in, in, in the purpose of Erstel? Um, thank you, and it's a joy and a pleasure to be here uh, and to answer your question, which uh, to a certain degree is also the conclusion, uh, is that, uh, in my opinion, uh, ownership, of course, is crucially important, but at the end of the day, the, the relevance of purpose, it goes across all kind of ownership and all kind of governance. So whatever kind of ownership you have becomes slightly more tactical. And I would love to try and come back to that and address it. But I was jumping to my conclusion in a way with your, with your question here. Uh, 
So if I may use my minutes here on, on, on a few philosophical things, it is very difficult when you listen to all these very, very interesting uh, presentations not to get inspired by them and then start derailing your own kind of thoughts and presentation. But I think that is worthwhile. So a few philosophical questions, then a little bit about some practicality, and uh, then also a little bit about what I see when we look at it from a more governance point of view. Um, first of all, I would say that the relevance of purpose, I think we can debate, but we are all on that page that it is relevant. So it's more a question about where and how we look at it. Um, but I think the real critical point, and it also goes back to ownership, it is to kind of stop up because in this room, I guess that everyone has purpose in their heart. A lot of places out in the world, there's a lot of purpose in the brain, because people know that should deal with it, but it becomes a slightly more mechanical, slightly more transactional thing. So you need to really find out and, f and see whether you are actually moving it from your brain to your heart. Because if you have it in your heart, it becomes part of your narrative. It becomes part of the way you want to do things. I had a chance to have a conversation with Colin a number of years back uh, in, a, in a slightly different context and he tried to frame to me what a purpose would be, which I thought was very useful because it, the way that I translated it, it was as a company, what global challenge do your company want to be part of solving? Because it kind of creates that kind of parameter and that kind of backbone, the steer that you can then start telling your narrative around. Because you need to be able to have the same narrative in its core, but of course with different words as you move it down through the organization. But two other reflections on purpose uh, that also came from listening to some of these things. I think we are in a world today where the need for leadership is becoming even more important relative to management. You can, of course, not, not have management, but leadership, I think, is so important because that is about creating hope and purpose and direction for an organization. And I think exactly purpose is one of the tools that the management in a company and the board has to really have the tool to, to work on leadership rather than management. So I also like to see it in that kind of context about how we create that. The other way that I try and want to look at, at, at purpose is to turn it on its head and in a way say that a company is a vehicle to achieve the purpose. Um, in one organization I'm involved in, our purpose is saving lives through the accelerated application of science and technology. But that means that the operating group within that actually becomes a vehicle because without the operating group, the charity couldn't achieve its purpose about going out there. So there becomes that very strong interface and interlinkage between ownership and the actual purpose. So to the degree a company can actually try and articulate that it is part of really achieving the purpose rather than it is just something that is being given to it and is a steer. So that was a slightly more kind of philosophical uh, comment uh, on, on, on this here. Um, in the debates we have had here, um, there seems to be a little bit of a discussion around purpose, and then there's a discussion about ESG and sustainability. And in a way, I think they all come together. I would be a little bit afraid if we put them in different boxes. But of course, purpose is what drives in the way we talk about the ESG and so on. But conversely, the ESG, for example, becomes some of the ways to measure and drive the purpose of the organization. So I think they are interlinked. I just wanted to make sure uh, we, we, we have that. Um, I uh, sit with Ørsted, which is a uh, little bit more than 50% owned by the Danish state. Um, and my issue here is not so much a question about whether it's a state-owned or not state-owned. It is a fact that you have a major shareholder. You have somebody to engage with. You have somebody to talk to about kind of the purpose and so forth. Because the board's role, in my opinion, is a bridge between the owner in whichever form and shape family, state, uh, charity, or, or multiple shareholders, but it is a bridge between the long-term strategic priorities, the purpose of the company, 
Uh, and and then for that's what attracts other investors, that's what attracts uh, suppliers to us, and that's what attracts uh, um, employees, etc. So so the board has this role there of being the bridge and trying to understand the shareholder and the governance structure, do the tactics that are required to do that communication, but not to try and have very different purposes because of one or the other uh, ownership structure. So. Um, what 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 the challenges that I see when we are out there is, of course, a little bit around and back to measurements. And I think there was an interesting statement, if I read it or saw it correctly, that the financial institutions were the ones where there wasn't an immediate correlation between profits and uh, and their involvement in 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 purpose. But at the same time, they are the the investors in in the rest of us pushing us to have a purpose. And what I find is that when I go on road shows and so on, and we talk about whether it is an ESG debate or whether it is a purpose and so on, but we try and bring that up, it has resonance when you go and knock on their door in their offices uh, in London or wherever. But when you then sit at the uh, AGM, uh, and you sit and you are trying to talk about your long-term value creation, which is often driven by purpose rather than the short-term profit, then you find it's very different people that they have sent into the rooms, and they spend a lot of time about short-term profits, or that one particular board member is overboarded or has been sitting on the board for one month too long. So, so my challenge back to these are, but you need to show up in the boardroom because that, or, or, sorry, in, at, at the AGM, because that's when you can go out and support or be critical about our ability to um, comply with the purposes and the st story and the narrative. And what happens there is very often when you then ask them that, they say, oh, but we don't have time for that. So that could allow you to take very famous letters that are sent out by some very big uh, investors and tear it up if they don't have time to come to the boardroom or to the AGM. So, uh, so that I see as, as an interesting challenge that we collectively need to, to look at in value creation. So to conclude, Thomas, you would say that the purpose is owned by the board, but the owners have to sign on. Is that a correct uh, interpretation of what you're saying? Yeah, I think both own, yes. Yes, okay. I think there's a little bit of sequence, but I think both need to own it. But but I think the purpose uh, and the strategic priorities, and they need to go together, you know, the, uh, in order to do that. That is the contract we have with our investors, and through that with all the other stakeholders. And when you make, you did make in your maybe not in your time, but before you made a major shift from black to green energy, right? Focus. It was, it was yeah. in my it, it was, okay. Yeah, yeah. Basically, so how did you make sure that the owners were on board, the state, the Danish Ministry of Energy or Finance? I'm not sure. Yeah, we, we are fortunate that we, we sit with the Ministry of Finance yeah. because then, yeah. uh, then they can't elevate it. That's right. They have to take, make the decision. Um, a, a, a question, it's a number of things, but the, the fact that there was a burning platform and a company that, that was in trouble, a belief that you could make renewable energy competitive, and, and, and that was probably the, the key thing which was important, that we believed in that. And then one shareholder whom you could then talk to, to, to have that agreement. And then, of course, very lucky with timing because the whole yeah. renewable was off there and there was an interest in, in doing it. But if we hadn't proven over the first two years that the cost of electricity, then we would have been right. slaughtered. Right, so there's a business case, which is there's very important. There's a business important. case. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. So basically, just 30 seconds about you. You were instrumental in getting the purpose statements yeah. recommended in the Danish best practice code, our corporate governance code. This was the guy who did it, right? You know. Yeah, so, we, so, we so obviously we, we believe committee. that it has universal validity, right? Or at least yeah. for the Danish listed companies. Yeah, the interesting thing here, of course, is the different cultures and so on. And, and in, in the UK, uh, if you look at the, the corporate governance, uh, basically the first role of a board is to make sure that the, the strategy is aligned with the purpose. Uh, we succeeded in Denmark at getting it in as a last point. <laughs> 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 uh, and it was more that we needed to, as a board, have it. I think the interesting thing is how a board actually engages in trying to understand it and how does it get implemented. And that's where I see some companies, and I especially see it in the UK, there's a much more structured approach to 
what is it that the board gets involved? How do they see that the purpose? What are some of the knowledge points uh, around how you sign off on it? But it is now in there in Denmark, and there's a great discussion around it, and it will slowly come yes, higher up. it will be elevated over yeah. time, we hope, Brad. Very good. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Thomas. And now Julian. Julian will ask Julian whether, you know, we have this discussion about best owners. Can, can companies sometimes choose their owners? Very good. Uh, they said of President Gerald Ford that he couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. Otherwise, he was prone to accidents. Well, <laughs> it's like that with me holding a microphone and talking at the same time. So this is why I've got this contraption on. What I'm going to talk about is managers managing ownership. And this is kind of work that I'm doing with Colin Mayer, with Hideaki Miyajima, and uh, uh, Rio Ogawa. To a British investor ear, managers managing ownership really grates on them. We want to limit the discretion of management. There are agency costs. Management want to entrench themselves. And much of UK regulation is about limiting managerial discretion. An example is the compulsion to use rights issues, which is, we know, part of European uh, company law. Very limited discretion to place shares, just a few percent over a period of three years. And this is all because we kind of distrust giving management discretion. You will see in Claudine's description early this morning, this interesting issue about the alignment of investors or ownership with corporate purpose, that some owners do not align with corporate purpose and other owners do. And that gives rise to, the, I think, the question which uh, we brought up right at the beginning. Should we allow managers to have some discretion to shape the ownership of the company and maybe align ownership with purpose? And here we've got an experiment on, uh, in Japan where historically Japanese management have had that discretion to align own, or to choose the ownership of their companies. After the Second World War, what we saw was the emergence of cross holdings, stakes held by banks and insurance companies. And these were in aggregate so large that they co constituted the majority of the Japanese stock market. Their purpose, or one of their purposes, was certainly to prevent unwelcome changes of control, and probably also to entrench management. If you like, it was a private benefits of control story. And you will not be surprised that the empirical evidence is that it was value destructive. It really fell apart in the last two decades of the 20th century, particularly during the lost decade, where Financial institutions, corporations found that they needed the cash and gradually these cross holdings unraveled. There was also prodding from the Japanese government. But what we see emerging in the 21st century in Japan are intercorporate holdings. And why are these intercorporate holdings different from those cross holdings of yesteryear? There are three differences. First of all, they're much larger. The intercorporate holdings were generally quite small, although in aggregate, very large. These intercorporate holdings are substantial. 5% is not at all unusual. They are strategic. They're about business forming business relationships, joint ventures. And third, and most interesting to us as researchers, they're largely financed through treasury stock. And that is, the Japanese company repurchases shares in the stock market, 
puts a large proportion in treasury and then uses the discretion to distribute that treasury stock to other corporations to create these intercorporate holdings. The question is, are these value destructive like the cross holdings of yesteryear? And if they're not value destructive, how profitable are they for, from a shareholder point of view? And if so, why? And this is just an example to show you the build-up of Treasury stock over the last 20 years. Sherry purchases were only allowed around the turn of the century. And you can see in 2018, the level of Treasury stock was over 4% of the total capitalization of the Japanese stock market. And this, despite the fact that some stock that was purchased was cancelled and not put in Treasury. And of course, Treasury stock is being added to each year, but it's also being depleted by selling those, that Treasury stock and placing it with other corporations and other purposes. And indeed, you can see that the disposal of Treasury stock over this 18-year period, some of it is used to finance M&A transactions. Some of it is used for public offerings to disperse shareholders. But the largest proportion is used for placings. That is, Japanese management deciding to place the shares from Treasury stock. And who do they place it with? There are 191 placings of greater than 1% of market capitalization. And of those 191, by far the largest majority, 134, are placed with other business corporations in these strategic partnerships or joint ventures that I'm going to talk about. And I just want to give you two quick case studies. Nintendo, the heirs of the former CEO of Nintendo, who held 10%, his heirs wanted to cash out. And they sold this block. Uh, the, the channel in the Japanese stock market is called uh, Tosnet. It's, it's a channel by which come, people who want to sell blocks can sell their block via this particular market. And very often, the company takes the opportunity to buy this block. And that's what the company did. They bought the majority of the block, almost three quarters. And what did they do with it? They sold some of the block to uh, Dana. And with the proceeds of the sale of the block to Dana, they purchased a 10% day stake in them. And this was to finance a joint venture between the two companies. Another example is Suzuki, where Suzuki bought from General Motors during its financial uh, difficulties, when it was, went into Chapter 11, they bought a 20% stake in their company. And to some of the, the a, a bit of that stake, instead of putting it in Treasury, they immediately sold it to several associated steel companies and to a few banks. But the majority of that stake, they put in Treasury stock and then they sold it to Volkswagen in a strategic alliance. Those are kind of some examples that I want to talk about. Now, an important question for us is, to what extent are these, do these improve shareholder returns? And to what extent, if you like, do they reduce shareholder returns? And we use this phrase round tripping. By cumulative abnormal returns, I mean excess returns. I mean returns after adjusting for the stock market index, for the risk of the shares, the, the usual kind of financial economist definition. This is a bit more complicated because there are two events. There's the purchase of the shares, putting it in treasury stock, and then disposing of it. 
Now, when the repurchase is made, the stock market responds. And it responds because it's having to guess what's going to happen to those shares. Will they be cancelled? Will they be put in treasury? And if they're put in treasury, what is going to happen to those shares? So one event is the share repurchase and the window around the share repurchase, calculating the excess return around that window. And a second event is when they're put in treasury and eventually they're disposed of, then the market reacts again. It might re the, the placement might reinforce uh, the market's expectations about what it may do. It may confound it. So we calculate a second set of excess returns around that window of the disposition, the sale of that stock. And we add those two together. That's what we mean by kind of round tripping. And I just want to put this in a very simple way. If the disposal from treasury stock is made via public sales, that is the selling into the stock market to disperse shareholders, the abnormal return or excess return is minus 6.8%. There aren't a huge number of those. If in the second case, the pr there are private placements, and I'm assuming a particular form of repurchase, but I don't want to go into that in any detail. Let's just say these are private placements made from Treasury, and they create cross-holdings of some kind. That's the 134 that I showed you in the uh, previous case, the 134 of significant placements they generate returns anywhere between 2.7% and a little less than 1%. And the third case is where the private placements are made to strategic buyers, joint ventures, a la Suzuki and Nintendo. And there, the abnormal returns are 5.8%. So where the sales of treasury stock are made in the open market, th that is bad news. And that evidence is entirely consistent with the United States. When treasury stock is sold into the public markets, that is bad news. The company really needs the money. It's, not, it's about financing. On the other hand, where there's a private placement, particularly where there is a strategic reason for it, or a business relationship, then you see significant excess returns. And bear in mind, these are excess returns accruing to all shareholders. But the particular business relationship is for maybe 5 or 10% of the company. So let me conclude, because the chairman is standing up, and I know what, <laughs> it, even, even I know what that means. <laughs> so let me go straight let me go, as I turn into a pumpkin, let me go straight to the third bullet, which is this market in repurchase, treasury, and placement of shares, we think of like an internal market. But it is a complement to the external market. It is not a substitute. And the reason why it is a complement, it can only be value increasing if there is a vibrant external market. And 21st century Japan has been characterized by important changes in corporate governance, by increasing foreign shareholdings, which are now about 32% of the Japanese stock market, by active shareholder act activism. So this, for the internal market to be profitable, there has to be the discipline of an active external market. They are complements, they're not substitutes. Very good. I just, I mean, I'll call you out on, on the wider implications here because this is a Japanese story now. Do you think the time is ripe, you know, for rethinking, you know, the role of managers generally in shaping the ownership structure of companies? I, I think we, we have this cu curious, especially the, 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 the British are very, prone to this schizophrenia, we appoint management. We expect them to do the right things, but we don't really trust them. Yes. 
And, you know, we, 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 we limit their discretion as much as we can. And it's kind of odd. You can, you can build a car plant, a steel plant, or anything. We trust you to do that. But if you want to issue shares, well, we don't trust you to issue them to the <laughs> right people. So I think rethinking managerial discretion, and certainly if you believe in corporate purpose, how to align, if you like, ownership with corporate purpose, and what role management can play in that, I think is a, I think is a good question. We got it. Thank you, Julian. Thank Very you. Very nice. Okay, Morten. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, I will talk a little bit about purpose and, and family firms. I think that would be the substance here, but let me get one step back and, and relate it to the two words, purpose and ownership. And I think uh, both of these <laughs> concepts uh, are challenging. And, and we already have a long discussion of many good in, uh, contributions on what is purpose. And I think we already saw a variety of ways of measuring purpose, one from the work environment side, one from the sustainability side, one I would call the, the stakeholder side. And this is also what, you know, me as a scholar in corporate governance, econ and finance, uh, challenge me uh, because I like outputs. I like outputs more than inputs. And when we come to the outputs, we end up in, I would say, more traditional concept. Is it the work environment? Is it the sustainability ECG? Is it the value-based leadership? Is it the culture that uh, some professors have talked about for 20 years? And we always end up measuring that. So I would be a bit agnostic on the key word of purpose in my talk today. The second thing I would say is about ownership. And I think this session, uh, if it doesn't do anything else, it takes the ownership concept a little out of the traditional US context. In the US research literature, we talk a lot about uh, shareholder proxies and votes, and, and in particular, institutional investors and the big three. I would say, and it's a very hard claim, this is less relevant outside the US context. You know, I, I um, for many years, were <laughs> the family business professor at INSEAD and did a lot of work on Asia and Japan and other places. It's really the identity of the core owner that shapes firms' outcomes on all these purpose-related uh, measurement. It is not I would say it's, it is, but it's second order what the institutional investors in most of these firms vote on uh, proxy statements. So with that, uh, it is super interesting to discuss what is the relationship between different types of owners. We already saw three here. We saw the, the foundational owners. We saw the government owners. We can think about private equity owners. We can think about uh, <coughs> hedge fund owners, we can think about public traded firms, and we can think about businesses which are controlled by individuals or families. Um, and this is where I come to. And we know very little systematic research that links different types of ownership. What we do is we often write cases, and I published probably 35 of these, mostly on family firms. Um, the problem with cases, in particular in settings like this, is we always invite, you know, the very successful cases, right? I mean, if you are a windmill company, it's not too hard to say we have a good purpose and we improve, uh, we improve the, the global situations, right? I was the Hoffman professor paid by La Roche, I should say, for many years. And, you know, if you're a medical company, <laughs> it's not too hard to say uh, that you have a good purpose because you save people's lives and, and you make people more healthy, right? Um, we really want to look at the bad cases, and, and they tend not to show up in, in, uh, in assemblies like this or World Economic Forum. So that's why we need some research, and there's actually surprisingly little research. Uh, one of the recent papers which have been discussed a lot in the family business community is the one I stole a slide from and put up here by Bill in Villalonga and, and Corvus. And what they did was they took one outcome ECG. Um, and ECG, of course, is something we talk a lot about. And I was a little 
right that it's a no word now. It, it almost had the feeling this morning that now we cannot talk about ECG anymore. It has to be on a different meta level. I would say in World Economic Forum and and you know many super ECG is still what we are trying to get to. And if you open up the ECG, it covers everything we talk about, right? Employees, stakeholders, everything in the S. So. Uh, why do we care about family firms? Um, family firms is the most dominating organizational form in the world. You know, only in the US and partly in the UK, among the public traded firms, it's not the dominating ownership form. In every other country, it's dominating. It's totally dominating among the private firms. And it is definitely, uh, in many countries, even 50, 40% of the public traded companies. So the identity of being a family that controls the firm is probably a, a, a very useful place to start. Now, the first <laughs> result we have which link purpose ECG to ownership structure uh, is uh, <laughs> this case here, which is uh, something I stole from, as I said, Villa Longa, Bill and Villa Longa and her coffers. And what they tried to do was they tried to uh, look at uh, ECG ratings and then link it to ownership structures. And there are many, many things you can say about this study. Uh, we, we had a great conference uh, last week on ownership and sustainability. And uh, <laughs> the interesting thing here is that at least it seems that there seems to be a huge variation in outcomes and ownership structures. And in their studies, the family firms don't come up very well. And to say at least, they seem to come out less in the red zone here. Uh, they seem to be, when we talk about ECG ratings, family firms seems to do, on average, not so good. And actually the management control <laughs> firms that Julian is, is talking about in Japan seems to be those who are doing best on the ECG. Government is actually not doing too bad here. Uh, and uh, <coughs> individuals' ownership and, and public trade corporations a little bit bad. Now, there are many things to say here, but what I want to emphasize is that this is when we measure ratings. And one of the things that we have to separate is actually outcomes from ratings, because we all know that ratings has a lot to do with checking boxes. And that's the problem when we make all these ratings in the World Economic Forum, when we do all these ratings in, in accounting and sustainability accounting, professional managers are super good at at checking boxes, right? You know, if there's a if there's a box, we better check it, and we better do something so so we come out and good in these ratings. And at least the family firms would claim that they're more interested in outcomes. And I should say, for the conference we had last week, and there are some interesting papers we actually show that we, when we look at outcomes as carbon dioxide, are you already standing? So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, <laughs> uh, family firms actually seem to have less carbon dioxide. If I could go to the second slide, does this work? <laughs> wow, I have, I have two slides more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I talk about family firms, I would say the bottom line is really the family firms are the best in the world and they are the worst in the world. And this is one of the problems with our research and some of the research that, that we go around present is we do averages. We do regressions where we do look at the means. Now, heterogeneity in our samples are probably much better. And if you want to look at something which is even older than Casper that did purpose and sustainability, look at the great Quaker chocolate companies, Cadbury, Fry, Roundtree, all the UK famous companies. Um, I was privileged to write some cases with the Boa Cadbury on these. They, you know, had purpose from day one, which was 1837. And the reason they went into cocoa, chocolate was not invented before Peter Nestle in 81, but they went into cocoa business was A, because the big brother got the clothes shop down here and they needed uh, John Cadbury to do something. And B, people were drunk. People were doing alcohol all the time and they wanted to give people an alternative to alcohol, which was healthy. And that was the cocoa bean. So they went into the cocoa bean from the purpose of improving stakeholder relationship. Now, the interesting thing here is we talked about corporate governance codes and all this thing. Adrian Cadbury, the last family here, 
was the chairman of the CADBRAI committee, the first code of conduct and good corporate governance in the world. And when we interviewed him, he said, all that is in the CADBRAI report and the NERBO committee and everything which has been inspired by that is just Quaker values. It's honesty, it's, <laughs> it's all these good values. He just didn't want to call it Quaker values because he thought it was not that sellable in 1992. The last slide <laughs> is here. So, as I said, for every Cadbury, there is a bad family firm. Just think about the Sackler family, who you know, gave a lot of money to good causes, every museum in the world, but they earned their money by making people drug addicts, right? Or removing pain for people and created the opioid crisis in the US and rest. There's the Bakri Group in Indonesia, which has done the biggest environmental catastrophe probably ever killing around 20,000 people. There's the Formosa Plastic Group in Taiwan, which had court cases on their environmental behavior on at least four continents running. So what can we learn? I think what is super important here, <laughs> and that would be the last thing I say, is that there are drivers of good outcomes of purpose, for, to get the purpose word in again, and there are challenges for every ownership structure. When we look at the family firms, you know, they will identify with the long-term vision of the company. They will identify with the values of the founders, the purpose of the founders. They will be extremely loyal towards their employees, to their local communities, towards sometimes the country, to sometimes even the world, and they give back the wealth. Now, on the other hand, there are drivers of you know, being bad in family firms. One obvious thing is that they have weaker corporate governance often. And when there are charismatic leaders that wants to do bad things, it's, there's less checks and balances, right? That was the Parmalat case in Italy. That's the Bakery Group, Formosa Plastic Group, the Sackler case maybe also. Um, over time, and I think this is a super important point, entitlement, uh, in, engagement of families can become entitlement. And they care less and less about how you earn your money and more and more about how the monies are spent. And that's a non-go. What we really want to see here is not how people distribute their monies to good causes. What we want to see is how are the monies earned. A very interesting new case that, that we are writing and uh, together with Andre Hoffman and the Roche, and as I said, I was paid by them, so, so all transparent here, is uh, what I would call a third step of family engagement. So families tend to uh, see this as, you know, sometimes a luxury problem. These are really successful con companies and they can be good because they are very successful. And I think many of the cases we see are this. Now, the second step was that they then used all the wealth to get out to <coughs> really good causes. Now, there's a new tendency. Last sentence. <coughs> there's a new tendency where these families become advocacy um, in the sense that they do not look so much about how they give out the money, but they look at the impact they have through their extreme uh, networks, contacts, and the, that people listen to them. And I think this is some of the things that's going on in World Economic Forum and other places now. Thank you very much, Sting. Good, good, good. I want to ask you one question. Thomas said sometimes you have your purpose in your heart. And some people may have it in the stomach. I don't know where they have it, right? You know, there are different parts of the body. But so basically, um, is it fair to say that family members sometimes personalize, you know, the purpose? And, and, and can you maybe reflect a little bit about the, maybe we know about the costs here, you know, if they do it wrong. But can there also be benefits of, of, of having a personalized uh, purpose, if you will? Uh, a, yes, that is true. I think uh, at least multi-generational family firms have it in their heart because they have the legacy of the family, right? Nobody wants to be the one who closed the family business because the founder's legacy is there, and that is really in the heart. Now, this legacy can be good or bad in purpose, right? Sometimes it's just a product, you know. I know uh, an Italian uh, music company that has produced the best guitars for 300 years, now, that's not a purpose for sustainability, right? There are, like medical companies, um, which are, have it in their heart, right? So, one thing we can measure is that, for instance, family firms during COVID 
did react differently. Uh, family firms seem to be more value-based and uh, they are more, were more stakeholder-oriented during this unprecedented slide. So they, so they really used their values, their legacy, to think about how to react in the COVID crisis. A little bit like Mike said, that they used their, their charter of the founder when they are new decisions that they don't know how to answer. So a bit more agile. Yeah, good, I got it. Now, I don't know how much time we have. Somebody is going to have to stop me, but I'm going to ask for questions from the floor now. Here, Ben. Yeah, um, Dan Pochniak from Singapore Management University. Um, I, I'm, I'm delighted that you did this session on corporate purpose and structure because I think it's incredibly important. There was a lot about the family firm. There was uh, some about management control. Um, but I'm wondering about the state, right? I, I think Thomas said that this isn't, if I heard it correctly, that big of a difference. Um, I may beg to differ. Um, and, uh, you know, especially this is important because it's not just a China issue, right? If you go country, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, all around the world, India, you, you, you see there's the massive number of uh, SOEs. And, and I don't think there's enough about um, the state and purpose. Yes, so how to answer that? I mean, the, end, the question is, usually state-owned enterprises suck, right? Because of a lot of political intervention, that's what he's saying, right? Yeah, I, I, again, I think culture-wise, it's, it's very different. Knowing Singapore well, that they have such a strategic purpose and, 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 and on the things they do. In Denmark, the, the state is a light-touch owner. So they look at their investments in a few areas as critical infrastructure, but otherwise it's hands off. And, and, and in that context, it is easy. Where it becomes difficult is if they come in and tell me, for example, with windmills that, oh, we would like you to make a wind uh, farm here, but not in this country and so on, because then it's, it starts influencing. So yes, I think you are right, but it is a little bit of the balance between whether whether a state owns something for a political purpose or whether it owns it because it is good business critical structure. So I absolutely accept your, your pushback. I was just uh, reflecting a little bit on, on my own situation where it hasn't been a big push. Dan is based in Singapore, right? Where you have some of what you're saying, right? So, so he knows that, but, but there are other parts of the world, right? Did you have a remark? I would just say, I totally agree. I mean, you're in Singapore where you have good states and good state businesses, right? But the rest of Asia, the state is everything. I mean, the Korean chaiputs would not exist without uh, their interaction with the state for the last 40 years. So, and, I've, and a, lot of, a lot of my Asian and your Asian colleagues are very cynical over the whole purpose and easy team because they think it's a gimmick from the government. <laughs> good. More questions? Yes. Casper. Hey, my name is Casper. I'm a um, colleague of Steens, a uh, researcher at uh, CCG. Uh, so now we're talking about ownership. Uh, I wondered if you can briefly reflect on legitimacy and purpose, how you believe uh, purpose relates to legitimacy, because now we are talking about, in Carlsberg case, you were very, uh, including, uh, very much including stakeholders, but uh, I think it's a general point about purpose that it's not necessarily effective for ESG, it's not necessarily uh, legitimate. We're lucky we have Mike, who's been thinking about these things, not just as a board member, but also as a professor, I think. Can you? I think it's important, I think it's also behind your question, that legitimacy is something you earn. You cannot decide as a company, I want to be a legitimate company. So in that sense, legitimacy resides with the eyes of the beholder, going back to the question of who are the relevant stakeholders. And I think you can say there's a societal legitimacy. And I, you could certainly say that in the case of Russia, let's just take it because at least everybody in the room knows about the Russian situation. The legitimacy of Carlsberg was questioned for those five weeks before the decision was made to exit Russia. And I think, of course, it matters if you are an enterprise-driven company, but, but not only for that reason, also because you have a, it's an international supervisory board and they are all having their own personal opinions and moral compass. But I think you can definitely say that the purpose-driven enterprise foundation is much more criticized, it's much more vulnerable to criticism, and in that sense, we, the, I think we all know that the higher you go on the moral high grounds, 
the more you're exposed to criticism, and that sense of legitimacy is being confronted. And I think this was a very good example, and companies will face lots of dilemmas where you can say legitimacy where, in which market, et cetera, et cetera. It was a very Danish phenomenon, and you could have international board members saying, yes, it's very local. We haven't heard anything in any other low international media, for example. But that's where the moral compass and the purpose kicks in. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, maybe. We took too much time in our discussion here. Yeah. No? Yes. Um, thank you for your comments. I'm Sinan Arzum from Babson College. Um, so in the end, um, can we think about it this way? Like, we talk about Kosberg, we talk about Quaker. These have, like, longest family businesses, you know, long history, established. So they are prone to and ready to have corporate purpose and apply it. It's in their culture. It's in their skeleton. But for the other businesses, should we just say making the business case associated with the corporate purpose would work better and then help corporate purpose to be adopted faster with the businesses? So should we think more and more about to Julian's uh, examples, Thomas's examples? How can we make the business case with the, within the context of corporate purpose is a faster way of adopting the corporate purpose we would like to see the businesses with? Some of your findings were a bit like that, weren't they? That's the, the business case is part of the ownership structure and so on. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think this is a real issue. Is this a role for government and regulation? Or should investors be able to choose, if you like, uh, the corporate purpose of the company they're in? And how do you align ownership with purpose? I think this is a a really difficult question. I don't think I know the answer. I, I, the, the only area where I've, the only paper that I think of is the Hart Zingales paper, where Hart and Zingales want shareholders to be able to vote on decisions and, if you like, force the firm or encourage the firm to invest in a way that reflects the welfare of shareholders in the community, not just the profitability of the company. If you like, they want to be able to encourage force management, not necessarily to choose the most profitable choice, but to choose the most welfare enhancing choice. I, I happen to think that's consistent with corporate purpose. I think it's interesting to try and compare those two very different approaches. The heart Zingal is getting shareholders to make the welfare improving decisions. And if you like this, having this corporate purpose charter, I think matching those two, are they consistent? I think that's an interesting question. Okay. Mike, yes, a small comment. No, I just think there's one category missing up here and that's the entrepreneur. And you can say, at least we talked about, or we heard about that we are in the fourth phase of this institutional logic of capitalism. And you see a lot of entrepreneurs that are very, very purpose-driven. We've done a lot of research in the food industry, for example. And that is an example where you see a lot of purpose-driven uh, companies starting up. And as uh, Thomas indicated, they are the company as a vehicle for the purpose, if you will. And I'm sure we're seeing that across different industries going forward that, the, that they become more purpose-driven originally. Fortunately, we also do see some semi-old companies turning into per, uh, enterprise ownership. Uh, so I think it is, it is important to remember that it is very intrinsic to, to entrepreneurship as well, particularly at this date of time. And this is a claim in the literature also, and George Serafine, for, for example, has stated that you know, founders never really think about money, they think about ideas and purpose and so on. But you know something about Morton, about that, do you? Or yes. So, so was it true? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's for the, for another day. Thank you very much for.